year. Maybe next year we'll see each other all in regalia. Yeah. I know, Greg. Yes, fingers crossed. Absolutely. All right. It's four past. I think we should get rolling. Um, what we're doing here is the what went well and what you're going to keep. Um, and even some things that didn't go well that you learned from, that would be fine too. But we're presenting. Um, and the recording of this is significant because I know there are people who want to be here who can't for various reasons. And so we're not just presenting to the folks here. We are presenting to whoever gets a chance to look at this later. And these sorts of teaching tips, faculty to faculty, are fabulous. We're so pleased that this folks uh, committed to doing this for us. And we are going to start with Greg. And do you want me to keep timer and give you a one minute or you feeling confident? Let me know. Sorry, I do have my timer. Um, okay. That that good old public speaking background. Um, oh, that's so right. Make sure oh, my I have goodness. my timer on hand. But um, I, I can assure you, I am not going to take ten minutes. Um, and because it's uh, a small group of us, hopefully, we'll have more time for conversation later. But thank you for the invitation to uh, to be here today and to uh, talk with all of you about some things that have worked and some things that haven't. Um, by and large, I'm really going to focus on uh, some things that I've adapted through uh, the last year and a half. So three main themes, uh, looking at options, looking at the LMS, and then uh, doubling down on some things that I did prior to um, the start of the pandemic. And so thinking about some options and things that really worked for me. Um, before the pandemic had started, I usually gave two options for things like a final project in my classes, especially my upper level classes. Um, and usually it would center around one would do this type and one would do that type. And um, students really enjoyed the idea of having options. And then really during the pandemic, realizing that um, if I leaned into the technology, I had a lot more opportunity to play than perhaps I had allowed in the past. So my two options for papers, for instance, now turned into a reorientation back to the goals of the course and then giving lots of different options, right? And so if you want to do a presentation, great. If you want to do a video, great. If you want to do a website, fantastic. Uh, if you'd like to do an artistic rendering with an artist statement, absolutely. Um, performances, fantastic. And if you want to write a paper, by all means, go ahead and write a paper. So that reorientation, and we've gotten lots of emails over the, the last year and a half about going back to the goals of the course, and that reminder really brought me to the space of if I orient my rubric around the expectations that I want them to, to learn from the course, let's say at the end, then I could really open up the modality to as, as much of a creative process as, as my students want to embrace. So that's one thing I'm definitely keeping for uh, next year, which takes me to my next option group work. Um, I know all of us have had those experiences where students absolutely abhor group work, except for those three, right? However, I found during the pandemic that if I gave them the option to do group work when it wasn't a group assignment, they jumped on it. Like I gave them just the, the best present that they'd ever had in their life. And so I just started realizing that if I want them to learn in groups or if I want them to process in groups, I don't have to be the one who forces that process. Uh, in the past, group work would say, we're doing this as a group and this is the process and we're going to you know, assign you all and blah, blah, blah. Um, and you know, folks who commuted ran into difficulties with folks who worked at night versus folks who had jobs in the morning. And, and it just became a bit of a scheduling nightmare. And so giving them the choice um, if they want to do group work, fantastic. My midterm in my upper level rhetoric class, um, I just decided last second to say, you know, if you want to do this as groups, go ahead. I wanted them to be able to talk through and process some of the difficult content that we were discussing. And so if they were going to do that, then great. It takes away the option for cheating because if they're allowed to work in groups, why not do it? Um, and I noticed by and large that students um, started processing the material better than when we were doing it as one large group. And so that's definitely something I'm keeping for the future. Um, group work optional uh, when it's available and then get rid of some of those complaints and those constraints. The other option that I'm really focusing on um, is participation. So participation opportunities are something that during my PhD program, 
um, we had learned a lot that, you know, participation is more than just speaking. Um, and that when we focus participation on only on speaking, we are really privileging a very specific skill set and a very specific student. Um, most often our international students are students who are much more introverted, our students with disabilities, um, our students who are having a bad day that day are not going to have the same type of participation opportunities and then points that our students who love to talk in class. So bringing back discussion boards when we're fully in person for those students who really flourished in that discussion board space where they could process the thoughts and the, and the content from the class and then write about it later as a participation opportunity is something i'm definitely going to keep um, flipgrid was wonderful and i'm going to continue to use flipgrid as well especially for presentations but also some of my colleagues have been using it to serve almost like a video journal uh, and students can then comment back in video journal. And then all of a sudden these beautiful dialogues were happening that I couldn't make happen in the classroom if I did black flips in front of the class. So that type of um, opportunity for presentation and, and for participation is exactly what I'm gonna continue to do uh, moving forward as well. So those are my options. Moving on to embracing the LMS a little bit more. Um, prior to the pandemic, uh, I teach one of our large lecture courses here with Dr. Rostogi as well. And, you know, we've got 100 to 130 students in a classroom over in um, uh, IRC. And I don't know about you, maybe you'll talk about this a little bit from your perspective, but the idea of handing out paper exams with Scantrons and then collecting them all from 130 people now makes my hands feel like I need to wash them. And so quizzes as well, I, you know, would have reading, you know, pop quizzes that were announced the class before, um, you know, for, for students to kind of do reading checks along the way throughout the semester. Taking all that paper in not only was really impacting the environment, but also thinking about the spread of germs through a large lecture classroom um, has really made me rethink that. And so I am going to continue to embrace online exams. I'm going to continue to embrace um, online quizzing um, and reading checks as well. Um, but one thing that Chilton taught me was using pools and test pools. So for those 130 students, now all of a sudden when I have a 40 question exam, I create 50 or 60 questions um, of similar style so that students don't have the same exact exam every time, which has really also helped with that idea of cheating. Also with the LMS, which is not quite the LMS, it was more of uh, Office 365, but I put a link in the LMS is bookings. Um, setting up office hours prior to the pandemic used to be an email nightmare. I know for me, back and forth, when are you available, what's going on, if students themselves didn't just drop in. So using bookings and putting a link in Blackboard is something I'm going to continue to do because now students have the opportunity to sign up for a 15, 20, or 30 minute meeting with me. And that we know in advance, they get a text message in advance, you know, two hours beforehand. And the amount of people that stood me up during office hours has decreased dramatically for as well. So not having to have all of that going on. And then finally doubling down on some things that I did prior to the pandemic. Um, a lot of us heard the word grace over the last year. And while grace is something that we should consider, um, grace is also something that does have a Christian orientation, a Christian background that some folks may or may not embrace. And so even reorienting the idea of grace into much more of a humanizing approach to teaching um, that many of us have not been taught to do. I have what might be considered li uh, liberal or even radical forms of late policies in my classes where I accept any and all late work that is written work with a 20% deduction from the grade they earn. That in and of itself, when I got here to SUNY Oneonta, cut back on the amount of times and ways that students had to come up with creative um, reasons why they were late with things. And it took a lot of the pressure off a lot of folks too. They knew the consequences, they embraced them in many ways, and we would have a chat if it became, you know, serial so that we could, you know, say this is clearly going to turn into an, an issue as the semester goes on. Um, but keeping that idea of deadlines as something that we can, that I can use as feedback is going to be something I'm going to continue to embrace. So that students turn in by the feedback, uh, by the deadline, they're guaranteed feedback. If you miss the deadline, then perhaps we should meet in office hours. I'll assign the grade and give you the rubric, but detailed feedback, probably not going to happen. And then also, finally, asking students what kind of feedback they want. One of the things I've heard a lot over the last year is the amount of faculty and our colleagues who have been 
um, bending over backwards, trying to give all of this feedback and then having students not read it. Uh, the amount of folks who've been complaining that they're clearly not seeing the feedback because they're emailing with the exact questions that were offered in the feedback. Deanna Fassett, um, somebody who is uh, foundational in critical comp pedagogy, is really embraced the idea of asking students what they want information back on so that she also knows how to read it. So instead of necessarily reading it just for the fact that you missed this period or this comma, trying to avoid weaponizing things like grammar that can reinforce English hegemony, we can then embrace some ideas of what do you want feedback on? Do you want feedback on your thoughts? Do you want feedback on your sentence structures? Um, and, and kind of honing much more of the feedback that way. So I lied. I took nine minutes and 30 seconds. Um, so my apologies. But uh, thank you for the opportunity to share. And I look forward to some conversation. Fantastic. Thank you. And up next is, and I've lost my, somebody should know this. Do, 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 do. It's here somewhere. Is it you? It's me. It's you. It's Kim. Thank you. I just I didn't want to be last because at two, I know I'm going to have to like switch over to my phone because I have to go pick up children's. So I just don't want to be last. Awesome. OK, so I'm a very visual person, so I'm going to put like a slideshow up there, not because I'm like super into slideshows, but just I'm very visual. So I like visuals. So I'm going to put it up there. So let me share my screen. It shouldn't take very long. I'm usually pretty good at it as long as it works. Oh, they changed how you share your screen. Oh, that blows my mind. They did it like the last day of classes. So I was like, really? It's in a different spot. So tell me if you can see it, because I can't see. Yes. OK, yeah. good. All right, so lessons from the other side, because I feel like you cannot think about these things in the middle of a pandemic. You got to wait till you're done. So like, now I can think about it. Now I can think about what was good. All right, so what were some things that shined through for me for this semester? So I don't know if you guys know, but this is my first year here. I know most of you, I think, through TLTC and such. Um, but this is my first year here, so I have taught before for many years. So luckily, this is not my first year teaching. That would have been really stressful. Um, but so I had to adapt a lot of things. So here's some things that I feel like shine through that I think were actually good parts about this crazy, crazy year. So um, check-ins to build community. We'll talk about that. Um, some chat options. I like that. Mixing of in-person and virtual office hours. Obviously, I did not have in-person right now, but in the future. And then some videos that I made lots of videos. So the first thing that I did that I think um, I was inspired by one of my colleagues, Maurice Odago, was um, he like at the very first lab, he um, basically just asked everyone to be like, tell them something about themselves or something. And I was like, dude, I want to do that. I want to do that like all the time. So I have lab sections that are like three hours and they were online, so they did not take the whole time. So basically I was just like at the start of every lab, we had a question and we just, everyone got to say something. So it might've been something school related or reflection, like how are you gonna prepare for the upcoming exam? Or what are some things you learned from the feedback that you might wanna change, that kind of stuff. And some of the things were like, just fun. Like, what do you do to de-stress? What are your plans for the weekend? Cause it's a holiday for some of you, like that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a way for us to like, you know, talk about different things. So then what was the benefit? What did it add? So to me, it adds a lot to the community. I'm very big about having a classroom community. It's not my class, it's our class. Because if it's about me, that's the most boring thing ever. And it's just a video, we just watch a video. It has to be about them, right? So I want them to be engaged. So I think that really helped us form a community of like, I care about what you have to say. Your classmates know a little bit about you. It's not just like feedback from in between two people. It's between the whole class. So I like that. And also I felt like it gave us some connections. Every person had a voice because every single person had to talk. It wasn't just like, oh, well, if you want to talk, feel free. It was like, oh no, you have to say something, but just you can say whatever you're comfortable with. I was like, if you want to tell us something, you can tell us whatever you want, only what you're comfortable with. If you're like, everything's fine, you can say everything's fine. Even if it, the question is, what's your most stressful thing? That's fine, whatever you feel comfortable with. So I think that was really nice. And I think that was a nice way to sort of check in with people too, whenever you're like, this sucks. What do you think sucks? We admit it sucks, and that was nice too. So um, I really like having the chat options on team. I'm a big fan. Um, I'm a person who likes to chat, as you'll see if I'm in any meeting. Um, so it's really good that some students would put questions in there. Um, also, sometimes you can do a poll with like, like we need to schedule a meeting um, or a review. Put like for the time you like. And I was like, oh, that's so easy. So we did that. And so what I like about this is, again, it just gives everyone an option to, to call in. There's some people who never said anything out loud, but were constantly chatting in the chat. There's some that were like, did both, and there's some who didn't. 
either, which is fine. Um, but it just gives you more options. So it's a nice flexibility for that. Um, you can choose the format you're most comfortable with, but also you can do timing. So like they might ask a question. And I'm like, oh, it's not quite time for that question because I'm still talking, but they can get it on there on the books, not have to wait for an opportunity to jump in. And some students really like that. So I like that. Um, I'm going to have virtual office hours. I like having office hours on Teams, not as the only option, um, but I had some students who came for questions. I could use my iPad and Notability now that I'm like proficient in that. That works a lot better. So um, I, cause I have to draw everything for my class. So that's really nice that I can do that. And then students can screenshot it. So before I'd always do it on note cards and give them the note cards. Now they can just screenshot it and they have whatever I wrote down if they want it. So that's kind of nice. And again, this is flexibility. This is for me because I have to go home and pick up children at school because right now we don't have after school programs. Maybe at some point those will come back, but that would be great. Um, so I have to be home at a certain time. So it'd be really bad if I had to have all my office hours before the time I have to leave to get them because I live in like by Cooperstown. So this way I can have some that are before like on campus and then some that are later in the day. So that way it's a little bit better for when students have time open. They tend to have more late hours because they're science people with, with lab times that are free on different days. So I like that. And then the last thing is I had videos um, and before I'd always said I was going to make videos and I just never did because I never had to. And this just forced me to. So I've always used Flip Classroom for a really long time. Um, but before I just said, well, you know, just read the book and then we'll just figure some stuff out. So I'd always do like pre stuff ahead of time for that. And now I can just do pre lecture videos. And then I've been using Explain Everything, which is super awesome. So I like that this gives them a first exposure that's not just like at the start of class and I'm rushing because I we're trying to get to group work. I can give them more detailed explanation. They can watch it and take notes at their own pace however many times they want to. They can pause me. People like to pause apparently. Um, that's the thing they like. And also it has a lot of rewatchability. I see like you can look, I post all my things on YouTube and you can see the big spike of when people watch them is like right before the test and you can see which videos they're really looking at. And I really like that, that they're really rewatching the ones they need. So, and then just a little bit more about the what. Um, I like explain everything if you guys ever want to use it. It's so fantastic. You can draw on it because everything I do is drawing and you can show yourself drawing it or it can just like magically appear as you do the video. And the best part is you can edit the sound and the screen independently. So I can do all my drawings and then go back and think about what I want to say. I can edit just the audio part while I was, while I was drawing something and leave the drawing the same. It's amazing. And then um, also just choosing what topics to keep. I'm not going to do it every single day of class. I feel like that's too much. I'm just going to focus on either picking the more challenging things that I know they watched a lot or the things that are fun. Like I have lots of links to biology, but we don't always get to it in class because we're doing like work work. Um, and so I think I'll keep some of those like how organic chemistry links to drug design and stuff like that. So that's all I promise. I'm sorry. Hopefully I didn't go over time. I didn't use a timer, but hopefully it's fine. So thanks for the opportunity to share. Cool. I'll my screen so you guys can see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's so many. I'm like, I'm trying to take notes and I'm not quick enough. So I may have to ask questions. Hey, it's recorded. There. You can take notes at your own pace. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. Look All right. Up. Raul, you're up. OK, well, thank you, uh, Rhea and everyone. Um, and it's wonderful to be in this panel, although it's not that wonderful to be speaking third because many of my points have already been covered by the first two speakers. I don't know what, what to do, but I'll still try to do to add something new to this conversation. Um, I want to kind of uh, uh, I want to kind of start with a with a general position that I kind of uh, want to take with respect to online teaching and looking at it vis a vis in person teaching. And then I want to talk about some 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 of my experiences and some some of, some of the things that I found vital uh, that I would be using in in, in classes henceforward. Uh, so let's start with uh, with uh, how uh, with, with with my general sort of a, a, a philosophical position really on this subject. And what I want to kind of point out, and I don't know if this is the right forum for me to point this out, but I will because uh, maybe this is the right forum for me to point this out. Um, I think one of the things that I realized very early on when we started doing this online teaching was that we have a lot of misgivings about technology. We somehow sometimes have this heuristic where we understand anything technologized to essentially mean anything that is advanced. And my initial, or at least not initial, both of these three semesters now 
teaching online classes told me that my pre-online classes were pretty set, that they were pretty on point, they were on the job, I was doing things that were interesting, good, apt, and uh, you know, it suited, and, and it really uh, you sort of put across what I wanted to put across. So the one thing that I kind of uh, want to uh, steer this conversation toward is not necessarily to understand technology as, as, an, as an intrinsic good, and online or, or an in-person mode of teaching as, as an essentially primitive mode of teaching, which I don't know if, if anyone in this in this panel shares, I, and I, I'm pretty sure no one does, but I nevertheless want to kind of uh, put it out there because uh, people like you, Ria, and, and everyone else are in attendance and they're listening um, so that we don't have a situation where, you know, down the line there is this, you know, unsaid, add on expectation on new faculty to demonstrate superior integration of technology in your classes. Because really technology is not the current technological tools that we have. They are really not uh, mind blowingly more advanced than the, the, the intrinsic sort of immediacy of a human contact or human feedback that you get in class real time on the like all the time. So I. I kind of want to kind of first um, sort of hit that note um, and just just as we move on in, in our lives and, and, and you know, future semesters, just not to look not to kind of lose sight of this. The fact that uh, perhaps the, the technology of an in person classroom where where people are talking, that is that is an advanced technology that is not a primitive technology at all. Um, uh, so that's just that's just my uh, little bit of a, a philosophical standpoint. Um, now, now to the to the other more uh, more uh, more more tangible parts, if I may, if I may put it that way. Um, again, when I started uh, teaching online, I think I was uh, I was uh, really made aware of how important a learning community is for a class to function. I mean, I mean, a set of students and a learning community are two different things. And I think Kim was uh, pointing towards this very, uh, very effectively and very, very in, in, in a very concrete and apt way. Um, and I also realized this and I and I really thought that what are some of the things that we can do so that we can sort of amplify this idea of the class being a learning community and what are some of the things that we can do so that there really is this element of community that sort of uh, that sort of goes beyond, you know, filling a seat in a classroom and 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 sort of you intrinsically feel that you belong to a certain community. Um, so in that regard, there are certain things that I that I found that were very interesting. Um, the number one thing that I discovered was that was 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 my my appreciation of of rituals in a classroom. So just like as Greg was saying earlier, if, or and, and as Kim was also saying earlier, just starting the class with X, Y, Z questions always, you know, or always just like at the start of the class, we're going to talk about this or maybe at the first five minutes every Monday will be spent on talking about where we are on the syllabus or what are things that are on the horizon or anything at all, any kind of ritual. So for instance, this last semester, uh, my for my intercultural class, I had this ritual of every week, every week first class, I would introduce a new non-Western musical instrument so that students could listen to that while studying because all of their playlists had been exhausted by that time. So that was a ritual that I, that, that I kind of brought in and that was really appreciated by the students. Um, so so just this, these importance of, this importance of these rituals is, is one. Um, another thing that also helps, uh, helps was uh, really helped me was was this idea of uh, a Microsoft Teams channel titled Open Office Hours, where students can just like post a question which they think other students will also have, and they just post it there, and I respond to that, and that sort of takes care of you know several emails or people dropping uh, to my office hours, and my saying hey I've, I've answered that question there, just take a look. So I think. In my future classes, I'll definitely have that sort of channel on uh, because I can just ask answer questions that are rather obvious and that many people um, would have. Um, 
another thing that I really liked, and I kind of wrestle with that, is uh, I think, all, and all of us were were doing this this semester, this past semester, past couple of semesters, that we were, we were all sending, you know, the upcoming week emails. Here's what we're going to do Monday. Here's what we're going to do Tuesday, and here's the assignment that's due, and so on and so forth. Um, I want to continue that, just not in that format, because I know that when we spoon feed our students, we're not doing them a service. So continuing weekly emails or maybe bi-weekly emails or in some form keeping that alive while not really just like handing things on a platter, uh, just like continuing with emails, but making them like pointer emails so that they want to look uh, and they will have to do something to find stuff out uh, type of a thing is something that I want to um, integrate. Another thing that I think, and this is not, this is uh, away from the ritual, ritualistic part, was that another thing that, that I've been uh, that I've been really excited about is and, and maybe I should share my screen at this point, which I am going to do. It's not working on my system, of course. Um, OK, hold on, let me. OK, I think I have it. Yeah, so my assignments henceforward are never going to be um, like documents. My assignments henceforward will always be like storyboards where I have like a preface and here's the assignment. I have a couple of sticky notes that are pointers and you know I just make this like pretty much like a collage wherein, wherein I say okay this is an assignment prompt. Here's what I all what I want to do. Here's how I'm going to grade you. Here's the different deadlines to this. Here's a few pointers to this. Here's a few questions that are, that are going to be guiding questions that are going to help you with this assignment and all of this in just one space so that students can just like look at this and sort of uh, um, um, benefit uh, from that. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and I'm always going to uh, release my assignments as assignment videos so that as Greg was very rightly saying that we don't sort of weaponize this the system of hey I wanted you to do three citations and you missed one and it's a brilliantly written, written paper but I'm going to give you no more than a B plus uh, so that we don't do that so that a student can just like go back look at the video watch a video a couple of times and they don't they don't get a bad grade because they just missed out on something and they just missed jotting down something while in the class and so on and so forth so one of the things that I want to do is is always have my assignment videos and they would always be posted um, that. And last, I think um, one of another thing that I would I had a lot about uh, participation and discussion boards, but I think Greg has really covered it very well and that's that's absolutely fine. Um, so I concur with him on that 100%. Just one more thing of of integrating um, new technologies and new tools in group work. So like the tool that I just showed my assignment on is, is a storyboard software called Miro and I really, really like it. Uh, so just having Google Docs as as kind of like more or less like kind of like mandating Google Google Docs or some sort of a shared platform uh, for students to use so that I can go and real time monitor the progress and I don't have to go to ask how everyone is doing or keep wondering about how our groups are doing. I can just go and look at the, the progress and you know and every now and then just leave a comment or two there or to directing them one way or the other and that is something else. Uh, that I also want to do, and also because this is this really mimics uh, the uh, this really mimics uh, the uh, 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 the workflow in today's organizational environment, and so on and so forth. So, um, as the timer says, I'm done. <laughs> Excellent timing. <laughs> That Miro was kind of interesting. I'm going to have to look into that. All right, thank you. And Justin, you are on. Yeah, so hello. Thank you for inviting me today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm actually a lecturer in geography and environmental sustainability and actually soon to be an assistant professor. So I'm excited to be continuing to work with all of you. So as Royal just said, this is going last is a little bit more difficult because a lot of the things have been covered. So um, obviously one of the big things that um, all three have touched on are definitely the aspect of office hours and opening that up to everybody in terms of providing an ability to not have to come into campus, yeah. especially for those who are off campus, who are living remotely. But the other aspect of that is 
it's not just bringing in the students who are remote through maybe virtual office hours or through a camera lens. In the environmental sustainability department especially, it's the ability to bring in outside people who are specialized in that area. And that is something I am definitely going to continue. Um, one of the things that all three previously just talked about was the ability to have group projects. And the interesting aspect of group projects when everybody's a little bit re more remote. But I developed this whole group project where we're working with this charter school who was a, one of the first rural charter schools in New York State, and they're trying to develop a active learning strategy. And one of the things that I really struggled with is how do I get all of these students to really design active learning at material and how do they actively learn themselves when they're in front of a computer screen. So one of the things that I did is they were actually in touch with the teachers from this charter school developing curricula for that school on environmental issues and getting students outdoors. Now, once I get them back into the classroom, we can actually put some of this material together and design it more instead of just maybe a lesson plan. But we can have that dialogue with outside teachers, outside resources without having to have them come in for only 10 minutes and drive 40 minutes where they're not going to be more willing to do or they're going to be more willing to do that now. Um, and that's one thing that I really want to incorporate is bring in some of these experts more and more. But then that leads me to one of the challenges that I had also is that when you start bringing in more people, when you start cutting in your class time, you're losing some of your own class time. And one of the comments that I received out of all of my courses these, this past year was that they really appreciate I kind of did this dual modality where I had one day which was asynchronous and then one day which we were synchronous. And they really loved that model because that synchronous class was built specifically for questions and to work through project material, to have a discussion. I always had a presentation by one of the um, classmates would always present during that day. And I've Traditionally, we've always been kind of, especially in a lecture-based class, you've been modeled and molded that you have to present your lecture on one or both days. You give them homework that they take home and then work through. And with this kind of new change, what I realized is that I can give them the lecture as their homework where they can go home and watch the lecture. And then when we're in class, we're working through that lecture. We're working through any issues that they're having. We're, work, we're applying that aspect. And that was one of the things that I really recognized with a lot of the students is that when they get frustrated, they tend to shut down. And if you're not there around them, they're going to shut down and they're not going to do that homework until the last minute. And then it doesn't turn out to the quality that it can be. But if you give them that lecture to watch at home and then you are there with them answering any questions for them or doing some of that material with them, showing them in examples, I found that was really successful in how I'm framing my classroom. I think I'm going to apply that a lot more where I give them the lecture as homework at times. And then when we're in the classroom, we're doing more applied learning. We're doing some of those resources. Um, I believe that is most everything that I had that hasn't been covered. Um, other than that, the other aspect of having those lectures kind of virtually that I really liked is I always did grapple when we had athletes or when we had people who missed classes. And they would always ask, can I see your notes? And I was like, I don't have notes. I have what I am going to say, but I don't have anything that I can really show you where you're going to be able to catch up. And that provides them at least the ability to have those resources without having to be in the classroom, especially if they miss when it's not their own fault. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, you're, you're describing a really successful flipped classroom. Mm -hmm. And um, that's... I think a lot of people are realizing that in, in a lot of different ways. Like we all understood it intellectually, but now people are like, oh, wait, they can go back. They can take notes at their own pace. They can go look at it again. They can like, yeah, they had to, they had lacrosse. Yeah. Game, you know, state finals or whatever, you know, like things are for real. This has been excellent. I am so glad it's recorded, but I would like to open this up for questions and comments from the folks who are visiting. Um, yes, and I'm trying, I can't, personally, I can't multitask. I am trying to read the, the chat at the same time that I'm talking, not a good idea, Ria. Um, 
Yeah, take the lecture home is a good phrase. Excellent. So what kind of questions do people have? You don't have to raise your hand. You can just pipe up. And if nobody else is going to talk, I want to ask about that software for the storyboard. What the heck was that? That was wicked cool. I believe that question is directed towards me. Yes. So <laughs> uh, let me um, let me uh, share my screen again. The software is called Miro, and I found it like supremely uh, helpful. It's 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 a software where students can just do group work, and they can and you can make your own storyboards and so on and so forth. Um, um, I actually it used it a lot in all, free? all of my classes. Uh, sorry. Is it free? Yeah, it is. So so it's a paid version and a free version. And the free version is, is a pretty like it, it works. It, it works for group. <laughs> so I will um, I will just um, share my screw my uh, the window once again. Yeah. So hopefully you can see this. So. Um, yes. So so like here's how I I made this 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 particular assignment that here's the real assignment prompt. Here's what you need to demonstrate. You need to do some original research and, you need, and here's why we are doing what are we what we are doing and you know i'll just have like a couple of sticky notes just advanced pointers on on here's what i mean with this and some of the sticky notes are blank because uh, some of the points that i wanted to hear uh, were already covered in the in the in the uh, in the body of the assignment um and the fun part with this is that if we make if we compose the link as such we can actually have students post maybe a question on this storyboard itself and then I can go in and answer that question just on a sticky note or something and the assignment progressively gets more and more um, clear. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's how I how I did that. And so alongside uh, here's like so this is like the final assignment. Here's the steps to this assignment. Here's the details to one of these steps. The second step here, the jumpstart document, that's like the number one document. Here's something interesting that I that I found, and I think this sort of resonates with what Greg was covering earlier. Uh, um, and you know, just the fact that instead of calling my the first submission as an outline, which uh, which sort of makes students sort of uh, uh, sit back and sort of uh, it's it's it sends a jitter. Uh, just call it like a jumpstart document. Here's here's your jumpstart document. Don't don't even worry about it and so on. And of course, this is not worth many points. Um, so the students can just like navigate through this. And when I make a video, uh, my video is just like a screencast-o-matic of my covering all of these different uh, uh, things uh, uh, that I have on the storyboard and my explanation. So um, and for this particular assignment, I also gave them like a few questions that can just guide them uh, to what they can do uh, with respect to this. So this was uh, what it was. It's a really fun software. It's called uh, Miro. Um, yeah, so I used it a lot. Very cool. Thank you. Kind of just want to like mind map with it. Yeah, really. I mean, it really is a, is a mind mapping software and, 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 a, and a pretty cool one at that. Very nice. OK, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Who's that? That is Antoine, you're up. What you got? Uh, hi, uh, I have a question to uh, Justin. Yeah, so in, in my case, um, so how it works in, in from, for my course, they have uh, between three and four hours of lab per week. And in addition, they have 50 minutes of lecture per week. And I was wondering, my, I, I, I'm very interested in switching part of it to like you doing the flip class. But my worry is they already, you know, uh, I, not, I, we're not say complaining, but stressed by the amount of material they have to go through during the 50 minutes of lecture, then the three hours or four hours of lab. And then I don't want them to start to be scared and say, oh, in addition, I need to listen to a lecture before the lecture. That is, you know, they, they really like looking at the watches and say, okay, I have 50 minutes for this course, 50 minutes for that one, and you know, they're timing the things. So and then there's the 50 minutes 
pre-lecture to prepare, and then they come in class, and then they have the they do those quizzes, which they might say, well, I don't like it because I can I prefer going in class, listen to the lecture, and do the quizzes or whatever assignment one half time uh, between two class or lunch. Or I don't know what. That's number one. Number two is students that for whatever reason they start to losing track or being behind your class and then they have our time to catch up and then they think okay i'm gonna go to the lecture time but i i didn't have time to review the material so now i'm lost and now i'm losing 15 minutes and and and, and those type of situations so how do you how do you manage them how do you convince them you know no it's good you know it, it helps you to learn the material probably help you to get good marks to the exam do you make your exam in a way that it reinforces that or do you how do you convince them to keep up and and you know you see what i mean my, my question yeah. if, if i'm clear but yeah absolutely no that's a wonderful question and it's a, it's a pretty big challenge when it comes yeah. to that one of the things that i that i tend to do when it comes to designing the lectures i keep them fairly minimal where they get the information that's needed and necessary at hand. And I put diagrams on there. Um, I know Kim was talking about she draws a lot of diagrams and I actually try to embed them into my lectures because um, unless they're sitting there recording them when I'm drawing them on the board in class, they won't always remember the step-by-step -step processes. And when we're talking about atmospheric processes or we're talking about hydrological processes, sometimes that step matters. Um, but then when we get to the actual content of it and trying to almost force them to watch them to make sure that they they do do it otherwise they're going to have issues later down the road is one of the things that I do is I actually take mine down so I usually will do the lecture on a Monday and then we'll have a discussion on a Wednesday if it's a two-day class and it will the lecture itself will tend to come down the Wednesday or it will come down the Friday and it forces them once that comes down they don't have the availability to it anymore. So they need to stay on top of that material. And I will have the one or two that will email me and say, I didn't have the chance, but those are the exception and rather than the rule. And it really does encourage them to stay on top of that material as we're going along. Because I've noticed if you leave those lectures up, you'll inevitably, be get, inevitably get half the class who doesn't watch them until two days before a test. And then you'll get all the emails and the questions. I don't understand this slide. I don't understand that slide. So it really encourages them to really get on the ball and stay on top of the game. And the other aspect of that is the time constraints and the time limit. And that is something that I did struggle with is not giving them too much information and not giving, not taking up too much of their time where I had to kind of rethink the class. Maybe I don't have to cover as much anymore, but what I cover, I cover very well. Or maybe we don't have to hit on every single topic within the three hour lecture and we do two out of the three. And that third one is really making sure they have the time to get the bare bones of what I want out of it. And that is something that they really have appreciated too, is that they didn't feel as overwhelmed because they didn't spend so much time doing um, their homework that took five hours when it should take maybe only two if there was somebody there helping them with it. Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. It just made me think about one thing. I don't know if I will have time to do that, but um, in that regard, what about, so let's say you know very well you failed and you know that there's um, various topics that overlap for understanding of a, a, an important concept. Mm -hmm. And you give them a choice of four topics. They, they choose one on the four of their closest to their interest, and they're going to dig into it. But at the end of the day, no matter which topics they, they choose for, they choose, they will cover the same important concept you want. And yeah. then then like and then they bring that in class and then you do work study and work with that. That could be also. An yeah, absolutely. And actually, I'll add one little quick um, thing to that as well. One of the things that I found really nice and interesting is especially in our department, we don't have prereqs. They're not very common and it can be infuriating because you're trying to teach with people who have all the knowledge and then some students who have very little and providing even kind of early, almost foundational information lectures to them. Sometimes some of the issues that they're having are fundamental things that you think that they know that they have no idea. 
And by providing that supplemental information that you don't have to teach, but it's just there for them, um, that is very helpful to them as well. And it really reduced the questions I've noticed. Okay, thank you. You're answering very well my, my question. Thanks, very helpful, thank Perfect. you. And I think I want to highlight something that I, I agree with. And you, you said you went back and you really thought about what are the important things I want my students to know by the end of this course? Because there's an enormous amount of information. Some fields are very, you know, information rich or content heavy. And yet we do live in the age of the Internet. And as long as you know where to access information, if you know how to think about it, how to manipulate it, what to do in certain situations, you can grab that information. But what's imp what do I need you to know by the end of this class? I need you to know how to do this. You can look up the vocabulary word, but I need you to know how to do this. And that's being clear on what those are. This this, this whole scenario very much made me think about, so when, what's the point of what I'm doing? And I, I got better results when I was clearer with myself because then I could be more clear with my students as well. So yeah, I think that's really key. You know, and I want to jump in here too, Rhea, as you're, as you're thinking, one point that I forgot to bring up that I was thinking about last night was the idea of slowing down. Like the pandemic in general for everyday life has really taught me to slow down. Like every weekend doesn't need to be booked. Now every night doesn't need to be booked, right? Like, I mean, just actually enjoy some downtime. Um, and that's one thing I think that I ended up, I, I thought I cut out some material, especially from the, uh, the upper division classes and then realized it wasn't enough, you know, as we were going on through the pandemic. And so that moment of like, you know what, we can cut that, we can cut that, just kind of slow down and just let some of the material marinate a little longer than I probably would if we were in person, um, ended up being actually a really good, really good tool for me to use. Yeah, and Kim was just putting in the chat, what's the point of covering everything if they can't absorb it, then it's not as though it didn't get covered. And that's, but yeah, really going deep. And I kept, I had a note on my computer that said exactly that, I want to do less, I just want to do it better. You know, I wasn't successful at all in the faculty center, but my class was much better. <laughs> Yeah, I looked at my class and I was like, you know, if they don't know every single organic chemistry reaction at the end, I'm fine with that. But they now know how to do mechanisms. And that's like the key thing we have to explain how they work. And so I had students who like was like, oh, I didn't take organic too, but I did really well on it on the MCAT because I knew how to do the process. And I was like, da ding, victory. I'm so happy with myself. And that was like my best day in my teaching life, I feel like, because it was like, oh yeah, I didn't learn it from you. I learned it because of you. And I was like, exactly. So that's great. So I feel like that's what I want them. Yeah, and you're bringing up that it's like, it's not about me, the professor. It's about what you, the student, are taking with and getting and having and understanding. It's it's not about me. As a matter of fact, yeah. I'm pretty minuscule to this, but I am here to facilitate things about you. Yeah, yeah. And when they get that, that's a big deal. And I think this, this, if I may jump in, this I think relates to what Chester was actually um, mentioning that uh, uh, we in this uh, in this pandemic, we, we were very OK with the fact that everyone has all students have their own kind of time schedules and they, they, are, they have their own kind of timelines and we were very flexible with that. Uh, so this this idea that we just introduce key ideas and let them brew for longer than just like hitting points and, and moving on. I think that is something that that I will definitely take uh, from this experience and from this 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 discussion, because now it's it's making me think about it more and uh, connecting it to what Justin was saying, that even in a regular semester, there are always students who have an atypical timeline. They may be working students. They may be athletes. Um, um, they may be. I mean, I, I work with, with 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 the wrestling team here and, and I know that their schedules are very different and, and their commitments are different. Um, so just entertaining this idea that all students will have a reasonably variable timeline and just letting important topics brew for longer is is definitely going to be one thing that I'm going to take away from this for sure. And I also want to know, too, I think some of it as we're talking, I'm, I'm hearing a bit of our privilege in, in being able to do this in some of our classes, knowing full well that some of you and some of your departments may need to have a much more department based conversation about what courses really need to hit what measures and what marks, especially those uh, departments that are accrediting bodies and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, just to throw that little disclaimer on the bottom of the screen. 
Absolutely. Antoine, you've got another question. Uh, yeah, that's what it's uh, more uh, what I was thinking about, uh, what I learned from using um, online um, teaching is that I've realized that a lot of professor that might be from experienced professor or experienced professional, maybe, uh, you know, another generation now are very comfortable with online software and conference. So that means that if you think about it, now we have the world that we can reach. And what I like I, I liked to do before, but it was hard to reach professor for that is after an exam, the following course, I'm trying to reach professor or professional that can give an application in real life or what was about the exam. But it's, it was difficult because, you know, you cannot we're not wealthy enough to buy a plane ticket from someone from Harvard to give us uh, a 50 lectures. But now with this online, I'm thinking about reaching professional or academics that can give after an exam of 50 minutes on, I don't know, PCR or, you know, a nurse that comes and say, yeah, actually learning biochemistry, it's important for this and so I think I'm going to I'm going to try to work on it and use use that we have access now and people are more comfortable into that. That's another way for me to motivate students that they realize actually what you learn in class, it's, it's really useful. People are using it in real life. No, yeah, that's just a suggestion. Absolutely. And that that real world application contextualizing what you're doing. This is in the course. This is in your curriculum. This is in your college education. This is in your life. Just really being clear on on that with yourself, because there were things where I didn't think it through. And then when I did, I'm like, huh. But, you know, thinking about it for them and helping them think it through and helping them actually figure that out with you could be pretty fabulous. I did very early on pop uh, into the chat um, a link to a book that uh, hits a lot of, because um, somebody had mentioned that, that Greg was always teaching from his values. He's clear on his values and that helps him decide what's significant, you know? And it's a really wonderful book that I'm probably going to do as a professional learning community this fall. But if people want to take a look at it in advance, it's called Radical Hope and it's by Kevin Gannon. And it's about centering the student. Um, it, it, the subtitle, because you look up Radical Hope, you're going to get a lot of books, but the subtitle is A Teaching Manifesto. It's about 150 pages. I've read it twice in two weeks. Like, it totally inspired me. Uh, but I live in left field, so I'm always curious what people, you know, other people have in terms of opinions. But it is, it, it centers the students. It, it realigns our values in education is what he's really talking about. And um, I think... That's a lot, a real theme through all of this is that uh, people were really thinking about where the students are, how do I help them, how do I reach them, how do I facilitate what they need? So, very cool. Yeah, I think on that, Ria, too, I see we're getting close to time, but I, I think my biggest fight for some reason this last year, more so than even in the last 13 years um, of teaching, has been trying to get students to realize that that college is the real world. So often there's this dichotomy of, you know, well, when you get out into the real world, like, no, your body right now is, it, it's in the real world. Like it is doing things in the real world, right? And so <laughs> <laughs> trying to get them to like, not see this as practice life for some reason um, has been uh, just a, a battle that I haven't had to fight nearly as hard for some reason, so. Well, when things went online and got virtual, everything, it's like, oh, that's one of the words that used to drive me nuts. It's like a virtual class. No, a virtual class is a non-class. This is a real class online. It's not a virtual class. This is not virtual education. We're not pretending to do education. This is the real thing. It's just the online, which is weird. I get it. So, yeah, but this is the real world. And actually, you're right. The number of places that are going to now be you're gonna, you know, cyber commute in or work from home is a lot higher. These skills are for real. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, yeah, he's work from home. Yeah, some people are working from home now because it just works. All right. 
I do want to respect people's time, particularly the people who presented today, which was fantastic. I am definitely going to go back and watch this. This was super valuable. And um, we are doing uh, workshops. We've got, I've got one at three o'clock today on the welcoming or motivational syllabus. And we've got three tomorrow. We've got another panel like this of more faculty on Thursday. So please join us again. Um, even, you know, bring your laptop onto the porch so you can be outside. <laughs> And thank you all again to our presenters. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. Thanks, everyone. Take care, y'all. Thank you.